a science teacher. I'm Cheryl, and I slept through science. Each episode, we'll tackle a science question you may have learned in school, but can't quite remember or fully explain. And I'll take the risk of asking the dumb questions so that we can all understand the science we slept through. The bell has rung. Let's get started. Okay, Cheryl, what do we want to do for episode one? What question do you want to ask for us to dive into? What are shooting stars? Okay. That's an excellent question. I love that question because, of course, it's astronomy related. So it already is right up my alley. Yeah. But let's start here. Let's start with what you already know. We're going to do a little pre assessment, as okay. we say in the cool. education biz. Great. Yep. Uh, just to figure out what you already know, because like we kind of already referenced, oftentimes there's things that you know that sometimes you don't even know that you know mm -hmm. that can actually help. And I can build on those parts that you already know and also figure out the things that maybe you have a misunderstanding around to help you better understand what's actually going on. So based on what you know right now, whether it's completely right or completely wrong or partially right, partially wrong, how would you describe shooting stars? Okay. So it was not until I was in high school or college that I learned that shooting stars are not stars. Okay. And that was one of those moments where I felt very dumb and people did laugh at me. Oh. It was probably high school because I think I was at like a camp mm. and mm -hmm. seeing shooting stars and then learned these are not stars. I think they are either asteroids or meteors, but I don't know if there is a difference and what the difference is if there is between asteroids and meteors. Okay. And then I know that they're not stars. Okay. And I want to say they're big rocks, but I don't know why they glow. Mm-hmm. Because stars glow because they're like their own light source. They glow from okay. themselves. But shooting stars, I don't think they don't, they're not their own light source. So I don't know what makes them glow. I mean, I know what makes the moon glow. So I don't know, like, is it the same thing? Mm. Like, is it a reflection of the sun and that's why we see it and it looks like a star? Or is there something else that's happening? Why can I see it? I've never thought of this question before. Um, and sometimes they hit planets and I want to say that was the plot of Armageddon, which I just watched for the first time. <laughs> wasn't it, wasn't it like, it was an asteroid. That's an asteroid Armageddon. in Armageddon. Yeah. Okay. And it was like one that was going to destroy the, the earth. Planet. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. But meteors have landed on earth. I think. Okay. I'm pretty sure. And some think that that's what killed the dinosaurs maybe okay was a giant meteor okay yeah still don't know the difference between asteroids and meteors then and i mean it's just because there's a bunch of crap in space right there's a <laughs> bunch of like dirt clumps <laughs> out there okay and they're just flying around and then sometimes we see them i don't know how far away they are are they close are they mm. in our atmosphere which i don't totally understand atmosphere either like because they look like they're the same distance as stars clearly they're not because we would not see those because hmm. stars we're seeing light that was from a long time ago because they're so freaking far away but meteors we're seeing like in real time i think i think i'm seeing it in real time that's going to be my and then sometimes there are meteor showers which means there's like a ton of them and those are predicted. And I don't know, like, are they predicted? Like the weather is predicted where you're like, I see this cloud mm -hmm. front coming in is like, I see these meteors coming in and how do they know? Are they seeing that through satellites? Like, how could they see, Oh, like tomorrow night or the next couple nights, we're going to have meteor showers. And that's where you just see a ton of them. Those that's my, those are my knowledge. And those are my, 10 follow-up questions on top of what are shooting stars. Yeah, I had to start writing them down. Okay, so a <laughs> couple of things, though. Like like I mentioned before, you actually know quite a bit, Cheryl. 
So yeah, no, I'm very <laughs> impressed. And the questions that you're asking are really thoughtful questions that demonstrate that you're actually thinking about it as opposed to, eh, it's a thing. Well, I've so. never thought about this much before, but once I started saying things, I'm a verbal processor. So, Hey, that, that's perfect. That'll do it. But that's one of the things that scientists do is they start asking questions and those questions lead to more questions and those questions mm -hmm. lead to more questions. And that's science. I mean, it's not all of science, but that's a, an important part of science. So look at that. You're being a scientist. Yay. Okay. <laughs> so let's start with asteroid versus meteor. Okay. Because they are similar, but you're correct that they're not quite the same thing. Okay. They are similar in that they're hunks of rock in space, I think. Is that how you talked about them? <laughs> I think I said clumps. But... Clumps. Clumps of dirt, yeah. I think, is what you said. Clumps of dirt, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and the distinctions are anytime we have categories for things, classifications, they are technically arbitrary because there's nothing magical about the world that says, well, this is very clearly one of these versus one of those. There are categories that we as human beings have created in a way to try and make it helpful to understand how things behave. Okay. Does that make sense? Yep. So we could have just had a category of clumps of dirt in space, mm -hmm. and that would cover a whole bunch of things, and that would be fine, and there would be nothing scientifically wrong about that. It's just not very useful because there's yeah. a lot of differences between the different clumps of dirt in space. So yeah. asteroids tend to be, I don't know, a couple of kilometers or miles across to maybe tens or the low hundreds. Okay. Um, and so okay. they're, they're not huge. They're obviously not the size of a moon, but they can be relatively large. And they are floating around in space. Those are technically not meteors. Now we're going to get into a, a term, a terminology thing that is a little confusing and honestly a little obnoxious, but it's just the way it is. So there are meteors, meteoroids, oh, and no. meteorites. And these are different? Sort of. You can think of uh. it as... You can think of it as names for an object in different phases. So, oh, like a, a caterpillar and a butterfly. Yes. Yep. Okay. Caterpillar, chrysalis, butterfly. There we go. Great. Yep. Except these ones all have their names sound very similarly. That's stupid. But again, it is kind man made. Of. But so a meteor is the thing that you're seeing streaking through the sky at night. Okay. Like when you see it, yes, that is a meteor. Okay. If that thing, which I know we haven't talked about what that thing is yet, but if that thing actually makes it to the surface of the earth and you can pick it up off the ground, that is a meteorite. A little meteor. Yeah, kind of. Okay. Right? Okay. A meteoroid is that same object, but mm -hmm. when it's out in space before it's reached the earth's atmosphere. Why did they bother to classify it differently? Is it because I, we're really self-obsessed self and we're like, oh, now that it's an Earth's atmosphere, it changed, even though it's like, I, I didn't I, change? <laughs> I don't 100% know. I would guess because especially in astronomy, astronomy in some form, you can argue is the oldest science, even before it was actually science. Hmm. Ancient, ancient cultures have been observing the, the night sky and seeing things in the stars and the planets and motions of other objects. And so there are concepts and words that are around from before we knew what the things actually were. Okay. And so sometimes you run into those things where it doesn't quite make sense with the amount of information we have now. Now, again, I don't know for sure that that's what's going on here, but I think that might be one of the factors. Okay. Right? Like we may yeah. have seen, oh, a meteor and then seen a meteorite, but not known that they were necessarily connected to each other mm, mm -hmm. at some point in time. I don't, again, I don't know that for sure, but. And the meteoroid. Meteoroid. Free visibility. Yes. When it's okay. just out there in space, not really to earth yet. 
Okay. But can I ask a question about asteroids? Yes. Why are they in fields? <laughs> uh, so we can, we can go down this rabbit hole. Uh, all an asteroid field means is where there's a relatively high concentration as far as asteroids are concerned. However, contrary to my favorite science fiction series ever, Star Wars, uh, asteroid fields, if you were, let's say you were standing on an asteroid in, say, the asteroid belt, which is between Mars and Jupiter, you would not be oh, able to- Oh, there's like a set place where yeah. they just hang out? Uh, where some of them do, where a large majority there's of the asteroids belt. are. Is yeah. it visible from Earth? Uh, not without a telescope. But the you asteroids could, are too small. Like with a telescope, you could see an asteroid belt there. Y you could see asteroids in the asteroid belt. Wow. The belt is, again, it always gets pictured as these rocks are really close together. If you yeah. were standing on one of the asteroids in the asteroid belt and you were to look out, you would not see any other asteroids. They are far enough away from each other that you would not actually see them. So spaceships do not need to dodge them. No. Oh. But that's less exciting for movies. Yes. But why? So are they? Okay. <laughs> so planets go around the sun. Yep. Does the asteroid belt rotate around the sun? And if so, does it rotate at the same speed as the planets that it's next to? The asteroid belt does revolve around the sun. Okay. But not necessarily as one unit. So there are, without going into a ton of detail, the closer you are to the sun, the faster you revolve around the sun. Mm -hmm. If you think of any, and I don't know when you would have, but if you were to have like a ball on the end of a string and you were to swing it over your head, like in a circle, mm -hmm. the longer that string is, the slower the ball is moving around the outside. And the shorter it is, the faster that ball moves. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah. So that it's similar thing. Obviously, that's not gravity, but it's a similar phenomenon that you can that you observe. So the asteroids in the asteroid belt are moving slower around the sun than Mars is, because Mars is closer, but yep. faster than yep. Jupiter is because Jupiter is farther away. Okay. But they're doing what the planets do. Yes. Overall, they are. Is everything in the Milky Way doing that? So the Milky Way is the galaxy. So that's not just our solar system. We are oh, in the Milky I got the Way. wrong. What's the name of our solar system? We just call it the solar system. But there's other solar systems. Yes. In the Milky Way. I don't think yes. I knew that. Yes, there are. Okay. So there's just our solar system because, again, we're very focused on ourselves. Correct. Um, it does everything in our solar system or any solar system do that like rotation for the most part yes there are okay. exceptions but overall that is the trend that yes everything is revolving around whatever the star is at the center of that solar system okay, okay. cool okay. got it so now we got a little bit more about asteroids yep again we didn't go into a ton of detail but a little bit more about asteroids we talked about a meteor mm -hmm. right? the life stages of a meteor yep exactly okay mm -hmm. so you've got those we still haven't directly talked about the shooting star we said that the meteor is the thing that you see yeah but one of the questions you asked was like what what is it that's the initial question yeah right and then also why does it why does it give off light yes right which i've never thought about until i started talking but that's a really really insightful question though to realize that, wait a Good minute, job. where is that light coming from? <laughs> yeah. Good job, Cheryl. <laughs> so first of all, the meteor itself is tiny. What? It's super, super tiny. It could be the size of like a pebble from the beach or smaller. Oh, so it is very different than an Armageddon when an asteroid was going to hit Earth. Correct. It... And are all meteors significantly smaller than asteroids? Or are there times when a meteor could be very large? Uh, I mean, 
again, now we're getting into these arbitrary definitions that we've given. So let's say you had an asteroid that was hurtling towards Earth, like, uh -huh. as you mentioned, the one that we're pretty sure led to the extinction of the dinosaurs. Uh-huh. Right? Yes. As it moved through the atmosphere, it would probably light up like a meteor. Okay. But I'm pretty sure we wouldn't refer to it as a meteor at that point because it is so big. Okay. Okay. But you technically could. Like, I don't think it would be yeah. wrong to call it a meteor. I just mm -hmm. don't think typically you would call it a meteor because at that point, it's behaving in a very, very different way than your standard meteor. It's destructive. Yes. It's going to make okay. it to Earth, and it's going to make it to Earth and still be pretty big, and it's going to make a big, giant hole in the Earth. So if meteors are really small, are they hitting the Earth, like, all the time and we just don't know? Yes. Really? So there's a couple of different pieces to that. Yes, there are meteors. Like, so there's meteorites all over the place. And you can actually do a Google search. And depending on, depending on who you believe, like if you were to take a magnet outside and as long as it hasn't um, rained recently and run it over the ground, in general, a lot of meteorites are magnetic. They have iron in them, and so they tend to be magnetic. And so if you run a magnet over the ground, it's going to pick up little bits of things that are magnetic, and some of those could be little tiny meteorites. Wow. Not all of them, but some of them probably are meteorites. Um, but also, it's not uncommon for a meteor to burn up before it reaches the ground. So not oh. all meteors reach the ground as meteorites. Hashtag not all meteors. Got it. There you go. Which leads to your question about it lighting up. Yes. So what's happening is these objects are moving really fast. Okay. Through space, which is mostly empty. And then they reach the Earth's atmosphere, which is not empty. Now, it seems like it's empty because it's clear, but all you have to do to recognize that it's not is take your hand and move it back and forth really quickly. Right. And you can feel the air on your hand. Yes. Right. So, you know, there's stuff there. All you got to do is oh. you're just moving your hand faster. Wait. So if I did that in space, would it not feel like that? Correct. What would it feel like? It would feel like nothing. Well, your hand would freeze and all of the, yeah, I mean, a whole <laughs> bunch of other things would happen, but ignoring that stuff, it would just feel, I mean, basically it would feel like if you move your hand really slowly and you yeah. don't feel air, it would feel like that. Just your hand is moving faster. Okay. Yeah, because there's basically no air in space. I mean, I knew that. I just didn't think about that aspect. Yeah. Okay. So there's stuff in the air. The air yeah. is the stuff. The air the is air. the stuff. Exactly right. <laughs> it's mostly nitrogen, but there's also obviously oxygen. That's kind of important. There's carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, ozone. There's a whole bunch of different compounds that make up the air. I, some 70, I don't remember, 70 something percent is nitrogen. So most of it's nitrogen. Okay. Um, but there's a bunch of stuff in the atmosphere. And these uh, meteoroids right, that are moving through space are moving very, very quickly. And so when all of a sudden they reach the atmosphere, they're moving way faster than your hand is moving back and forth. Mm -hmm. And when things move past each other very quickly, things heat up. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so you is can it actually... like friction? Is it friction? So technically, like you could think of it as friction. Technically, what's happening is it's actually the the object is pushing the air in front of it. So in front of whatever the direction is it, that it's moving, it's compressing the air. And as you compress uh, a gas, the temperature goes up. The opposite of that, I know you've experienced. Have you ever had like an aerosol can? Like a yeah. like hairspray or like the spray air to like for a computer to dust yeah. things off and you spray it and the can gets cold. Yes. Right? That's yeah. the opposite of what I'm describing. When you decrease the pressure because you're letting stuff out of the can, mm -hmm. when the pressure goes down, the temperature also goes down. Wait, is that how my instant pot works? 
It's related to that, yes, because it uses okay. it uses pressure to change the boiling point of water so that it can cook things faster. Yes. Whoa. <laughs> Look at all cool. these connections you're making. I know, but now we can't do an episode on the Instant Pot, so. <laughs> Darn, you used it up. <laughs> so the object coming through the atmosphere, that meteoroid that then becomes the meteor, is compressing all of that air in front of it because it's pushing through it. Mm -hmm. And it's going so fast that the air doesn't have a chance to move out of the way. And so that compresses it and that heats it up. And it heats it up enough that it starts to give off light. Just like a fire gives off light, right? Or think of like the old school, do you remember like the old school um, stove tops that were the metal kind of spirals? Mm-hmm. Right. And when you would turn it on, it's black yeah. most of the time. But as it heats up, it starts to glow. But air is doing that. Correct. Whoa. Yeah. I didn't know that air could be its own light, like be light like that. Yeah. I mean, because all air is, is molecules, right? Again, nitrogen, mm -hmm. oxygen, carbon dioxide, it's just molecules. And molecules under the right conditions can give off light. We just don't run into those conditions all the time. Can you think of another example? Well, in the air, specifically the Northern Lights. Uh, now that's a totally different reason that they're giving off light. It's not yeah. because of you know increased pressure or temperature or anything like that. That has to do with ionization and electrons and cosmic rays and all sorts of other things. That could be another question if you want to do that at some point, right? <laughs> but that's the reason that those colors are given off is because the uh, the the molecules in the air, their electrons are doing really cool things and they're giving off light. Wow. That's cool. I agree. <laughs> so then that really, really hot air that's in front of the... Mm -hmm of the, the meteor as it's going through the atmosphere, like that gets really, really hot and it can start to melt and vaporize that meteor. And oh. if it's small enough, the whole thing will just mm -hmm. vaporize and it's gone. Mm -hmm. Got it. So are they happening at day and we just don't notice them? Oh, that's a good question. I haven't thought about. I believe the answer to that would probably be yes. Okay. Yeah. And then what about meteor showers? Yeah. Great question. So the meteor showers are, again, particles. It's caused by the same thing. But then you asked the question about, is it predictable like the weather is? Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I would say no. Meteor showers are most often caused by the third object that's kind of in a similar grouping as asteroid and meteor, which are comets. Oh, I forgot about comets. Yeah. I so, thought that was all the same too. Yep. And they, again, they're similar. Okay. Uh, comets tend to have a lot more ice in them than asteroids do. Okay. So like actual frozen, either water or oxygen or carbon dioxide or something like that. Pretty much astronomers just referred to almost anything that's frozen as ice. They use words okay. a little bit more loosely. Um, <laughs> that's fine. But so a, a comet comes from a different place. It doesn't come from, let's say, the asteroid belt. Comets come from other parts of the solar system. That's a whole other thing that we can talk about. Let's say, think of it just on the edges of the solar system. So either from the, either from it's what's called the Kuiper belt or from the Oort cloud. Oort cloud. Yeah. That sounds very sci-fi. Doesn't it though? Yeah. Uh, and comets oftentimes have orbits that are, are, that are not basically in line with the rest of the planets. So remember you talked about the, you were talking about the asteroid belt and how it goes around the sun just like the planets do, and it does. But comets often have a very, very different path. And you can have comets that are still very predictable, though, where they'll come in and then they'll go out of the solar system and they'll come in and they'll go out. Like, okay. like Halley's Comet, for example. 
I think that comes once oh. every 70-something years or something like that. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Well, comets have a tail. That's one of the things that is um, recognizable about comets is because as they get closer to the sun, the heat from the sun starts to evaporate and vaporize some of that ice plus oh. some other things, and then it actually streams out behind it. I don't know if you got to see the comet this summer, Comet Neowise. Mm -hmm. No. Oh, it was super cool. The first time I got to see a naked eye comet, I was very excited. I got <laughs> up at like three in the morning, which I don't do because I don't like mornings, but I did it like two or three times just to be able to see the comet. It was very <laughs> cool. Um, but anyway, so the all that stuff that comes off the edge of the comet it doesn't just disappear. It stays in the orbit of that comet. And for a comet that crosses the orbit of the Earth, there's going to be extra bits of dust and things that came off of that comet that are just sitting there in the orbit of the Earth. And so when the Earth reaches that part in its orbit, it goes through all the debris that came off of that comet last time it went through. Uh, and that's why you have a meteor shower because there are a lot more of those particles that are in just in space and it's actually the earth moving through them more than them coming and hitting the earth i mean it's a it's just a case of perspective but and so that totally makes sense but then how can they predict it they're like oh there's going to be a meteor shower is it because someone's paying attention to that rotation Yes, like, because they know at where the, that comet's orbit is, where it crosses the Earth's orbit, mm -hmm. and when we reach that point in our orbit. Yeah, that yep. makes sense. Mm -hmm. So it's more accurate than the weather. Yes, I would say it, it is. What they can't predict necessarily is the, the exact intensity. Mm. Or right, like how know. much will you see exactly. from where you are? Exactly. But as far as knowing the days that it's going to be, yeah, there are there are a, a whole set of meteor showers that we just know. Uh, you know, the the Orionids are ones in winter that we never see because in the Seattle area it's cloudy all the time. Um, the Draconids are another one. The Perseids are the ones that happen in August. Those are the ones that the only ones I think I've ever really tried to see because that's the mm. only time we have weather here that may make it you know, reasonable, but there are meteor showers, you know, regularly, um, all year. Cool. That makes a lot of sense. Yeah. I think the only other question that you asked that we haven't addressed yet is how directly is how far away they are. But I think based on the information that you've been provided, I'm going to guess that you could answer your own question. Yeah. It's just when they, enter the atmosphere then i don't know how far the edge of our atmosphere is <laughs> but it would that would be when it'd be possible to start seeing it yeah. right great cool there Top you go this guy look at that there's your lesson <laughs> yeah okay now we got to check and find out were you paying attention oh yikes guess what cheryl it's time for a pop quiz. I hated those in school. Oh my goodness. Except it's oh. not really a pop quiz because you knew it was coming. Yeah, I'm the one that wrote it down. <laughs> it's a thing we should do. <laughs> so let's just kind of go through and see what you retained and kind of okay. saying it in your own words. Because one of the things that we know from education is being able to explain something requires a deeper level of understanding than just listening and feeling like, mm -hmm. oh yeah, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So what would you say are the three main categories of those clumps of dirt in space? <laughs> and what are the differences between them? Comet, asteroid, various forms of meteor in all of its life stages. <laughs> Comets are icy. Some of them do the rotation. Some of them are super rando. I still don't understand what's propelling them forward if they're not rotating around Magic. the sun. Okay, yep. cool. I'm picturing pinball is what I'm mm, picturing. Mm -hmm. It's like bouncing off the edges of our solar system. <laughs> <laughs> um, asteroids, larger, going around the sun. 
not super dangerous if you're in a spaceship because they're not as hard to dodge as we think. Um, unless maybe you didn't have headlights or something. Um, and comets are, I mean, small by the time they get to us. And wait, which ones? I said the wrong one. Meteors. Yes, meteors are small by the time they get to us. Do comets ever just like hang out in Earth's atmosphere and land on our planet? That would be just as scary as an asteroid doing that. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, so that'd be comets a big and deal. asteroids are similar in size generally. Okay. okay. So I would vote for no comets hanging out in our atmosphere. Okay. Cool. Yep. But those are the three. Yeah. Look at that. And none of them are stars. None of them are stars, but you already knew that. Yeah, that's true. I do. Yeah, that's great. <laughs> okay. Why do they light up? Um, because the air is lighting up because they're going forward so quickly that there's so much heat being produced that it lights up, which sounds like a crazy amount of heat to be produced. And where does the heat come from? Friction, but not friction. <laughs> pressure? Pressure. Is pressure a better word than friction? Okay. Yeah. Because friction really is things rubbing against each other. Yeah. And there's technically some of that going on, but to the best of my understanding, that's not the primary source of the light. Comes from instant pots in space. Yes, exactly. Cool. You got it. <laughs> um, and why can we predict meteor showers? They are pieces of crap from the comet <laughs> that are hanging out on that little oval line that we've all seen where Earth rotates. <laughs> and then scientists know when we're going to get to those different points and can just put it on the calendar and say, here's where this comet's crap is hanging out. And then we just like smack right into it. And it was minding its own business. And then we just all of a sudden, like, Earth just, like, slams it. Yeah. <laughs> those right. are my own words. <laughs> yep, those are your own words. And I enjoyed them. <laughs> How do you feel now? More educated. Yeah? Yeah. Oh, that was so interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's why I like learning about science now is because it's so interesting. Yeah. It also helps that I'm not learning a lot of other subjects. That's probably <laughs> another reason why it's nice to learn as an adult. And because I'm not going to get in trouble if I didn't learn it properly, which was one of right. my fears in school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Your parents are going to take things away from you if you bombed yeah. my pop quiz. <laughs> Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, yeah. Low stakes. Low stakes. Yes. I think that's all we've got for our lesson today, Cheryl. Great. That was lesson number one. We did it. We did it. We did lesson number one. Yay. All right. Well, we got about five minutes left, so it's time to go ahead and pack your stuff up and get ready for my closing remarks. You can follow us on Instagram and Facebook at I Slept Through Science or on Twitter at Slept Science. If you have dumb science questions like I do, please send them to us. You can email us at I Slept Through Science at gmail.com or you can even send us a voice memo and we'll play it on the podcast. Please rate and review our podcast to tell other people what you think about it. Subscribe to make sure you don't miss an episode and share about our podcast on social media. Thank you to Beth Reed Miller for the artwork. You can check out more of Beth's artwork at Beth is something. Okay, great. Thanks. Bye. Ah! The bell doesn't dismiss you. I dismiss you.